Welcome everyone to Ladder Daily Digest. We're all about promoting um, podcasters or authors or other creative endeavors. And today we have, uh, for the second time, Ganesh Chirian, who's back. We had him on the show um, a few, five months ago, and he was talking about how he was creating a podcast that we entitled Kiwi Come Follow Me. Um, the Come Follow Me manual is about the Book of Mormon. And, um, and so Ganesh was going to do his own version of the Come Follow Me manual and do lessons like he was doing at Sunday school class. Welcome back, Ganesh. Thank you. It's lovely to be back with you guys. And Maven is my lovely co-host today. How are you doing, Maven? Doing and well. So doing well. We we talked a little bit about Ganesh um, in our episode, and Ganesh has done a Mormon stories, and we will include those in our show notes, our uh, description. Ganesh, uh, tell us a little bit about how you got to um, writing a book. All right. Well, so uh, gosh, like many Mormons going through a faith transition, I um, I wanted to know everything. Uh, you know, I wanted to know uh, what the real stories were and also um, why I had missed them. You know, those are the kind of the two big things. You know, I thought I was a, a thoughtful, uh, critical thinking individual who looked at um, things objectively. And, um, of course, finding out that there was a lot of history in Mormondom that I was completely unaware of or had you know, just interpreted so wrong, I uh, I needed to know why. And so in many ways, studying Mormon history was a study of my own biases, um, how I managed to look at the world in a particular way um, and how that was kind of crafted because I wasn't, um, I wasn't a cognizant or aware that I, that I had such a steeped worldview in a particular ideology um, that was uh, maybe not very accurate. So um, almost like blinders were placed on us, like we we could only see a certain path, and we couldn't weren't allowed to see the rest of the world. That's that's exactly exactly right. That's very humbling experience, as everybody has figured out. You know, to find out that you're wrong. Um, it's also the beginning of wisdom, I think, because you start to think, well, gosh, if I'm wrong about this, what am I wrong? What else am I wrong about? And that can be quite painful, of course, because you find out you're wrong about a lot of things. But it also can be endearing that you've managed to muddle through and, and do some useful kind of things and cared in some really wonderful ways, hopefully intentional ways. But even, even then, some good things have happened in your life despite uh, your blinders and your sometimes terrible worldview. So there's a bit of humility, but then there's also a lot of gratitude too. Sure. And and so approaching things with that kind of mindset, well, gosh, what have I got wrong? You know, can this be an exploration? Can I um, be excited about what I've got wrong and what I could learn if I uh, put some time and effort into it? Um, so and we, we also talked just a little bit before the show that your appearance on um, Mormon stories allowed sort of an introspection into your life. And you noticed that also. Where else? Yes. Yes. Well, I, you know, when you're looking at your life and you're trying to explain it to other people, um, one of the things that I've been working a lot on is Joseph Smith's life and actually seeing that he was doing the same kinds of things. Um he was trying to explain his life. Um, and one of the key takeaways or the things, or the parts of my research that I've found really fascinating, I'm a, uh, my background is in psychology. I've got a degree in psychology and I love people. I love what makes them tick. I like understanding how they came to their particular conclusions. Um, you know, discussions are fantastic. And so when I realized that actually the Book of Mormon was Joseph kind of explaining his life and his worldview and his hopes for the future, that, that made the Book of Mormon, for me at least, um, quite different, a quite different experience. And so part of looking at the Book of Mormon and then um, seeing that in the context of Joseph's 
um, youth. He's 23 when he, when the Book of Mormon's written. And then what happens after, you know, that that really shows me, or at least it frames the Book of Mormon, but also the church in a completely different light. And for me, it's been a healing kind of experience because then I don't see Joseph as um, somebody who was horrific. I just see him as a person who's trying to make his way through the world and he's navigating it in these kinds of ways, um, some of which I can totally relate to, uh, some of which I find incredibly horrific, um, and some of which I um, I can understand even though I don't necessarily um, buy into it. Um, and, and I think that that, well, for me, has been a journey of health and well-being in looking at Joseph and also the church, because the church really is Joseph. The church, when Joseph was killed in 1844, the the church kind of stopped there. All of the innovations that Joseph were ma was making, which were a number, kind of just finished right at that point. Brigham Young tried to do a number of add-ons and further that, but those were really walked back to 1844. And so the church today, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that is, is really a reflection of the 1844 ideology that Joseph left with or um, Ganesh, left over. About how long ago did you start thinking that your studies might be turned into a book? So it was about three years ago. I, um, I, I One of the ways that I process is to um, write. I, um, I've not really ever been a writer before, but I, I, I like putting things down and seeing if they then make sense to me. Um, uh, hopefully they make sense to other people as well. And so after, you know, I, I, I went through a faith transition, um, you know, back in, well, it, it took me a while, probably 2011, 2012, 2013. I, I, I went very slowly. I was just so slow, but part of what, happened for me which was fortuitous was when I was making all of these changes in my thought process and really trying to look back at the history the gospel ep essays came out and they validated um, much of what I had come to understand and of course because they had come out there was something I could refer to that the church was speaking about and so I was able to do a number of um, guest blogs at the time that's what people did back in 10 years ago <laughs> with um, Gina Colvin, who was doing a, um, a blog space called Kiwi Mormon. And she allowed me a platform to write a few things about some church history that I found interesting and different and things that we could learn from. And along with that, I wrote a, a, a blog about being a member and, and even being a, a, I'd been a bishop. So, you know, somebody who'd, who'd um, been in leadership and come across this information and it had changed my worldview. And I talked about the, the gospel topics essays, which were just coming on the scene at the time. And that uh, gave me a, a huge platform. People read that that um, blog, it became viral. And, um, and, and people started to ask the question, which was, you know, what can we do with the gospel topics essays? Can we talk about them at church? Are there things that will change the way that we look at the church and our experience in it uh, differently, um, or is this going to implode the church because now the church was being a bit more open about some of its stuff? So, um, and then I just wrote I from you, there. Like at this time, if if I'm correct, I mean, initially when they were rolled out, they were kind of billed as something that would be talked about in Sunday school, and but it just seems like that kind of announcement really never came. And I understand that when people did start incorporating topics, you know, the gospel topics essays in lessons, it made a lot of members sometimes like report them to bishops or, or thinking that they're being taught false doctrine because that wasn't made clear. So this is kind of like, is this the era that you're talking about where, where your post went viral about this? And, and is that why? Or and can you explain a bit more about that? Yeah, that's exactly why. I think, you know, nobody had voiced that, that kind of conundrum are we allowed to talk about this? Is these are actually quite difficult subjects, and um, and we're used to you know talking at um, Sunday school um, 
about stuff which is really easy and stuff which is really pleasant. And so what do we do when the, the things that are produced by the church are tough and tricky? That's right. And so you were, you were making these posts and it's like somebody challenged you to uh, write, start writing a book or was that just your own thoughts or what happened? Um, no, no. So uh, so that's back in 2013, uh, 2014, maybe. Um, and I just have continued to look at church history from the air and, and just explore and find out, really, because once I was open with the fact that I you know, didn't always, you know, that this information was new to me, uh, I guess it gave people the um, idea that they could also say, oh, gosh, this is interesting and, and new to me, and, and should I be... Um, uh, you know, be looking at it. Um, and so then I started to see that there was a niche um, and an ability for me to talk about some of these issues from a thoughtful, kind, compassionate space, but also be able to make it available to other honest. people to be able to talk about. Yeah, honest, honest. Mm. Um, so what so then um you know we're talking 2021 i guess that i had i saw the uh, sunstone presentation from william davis about uh, the performance aspects of the book of mormon and that really uh, captured me quite a bit because i had looked at the started to look at the book of mormon as a, as a framing of joseph's life and that um, idea interested me um dan mcclellan um, also talked uh, you know he had a TikTok was just starting then, and he he um he had talked about the idea of the Book of Mormon being a nineteenth century text, and I thought that was a, a, a quite a big deal for somebody who was a active um, employee of the church to start speaking about that openly, and and I wondered what I could do with that. I by this point, already read a number of, of books by um, particularly Dan Vogel, who was identified some of these things already. So I just started to write a little paper, really, re really just a blog post. You know, could I show that the Book of Mormon was really um, uh, about Joseph and his 19th century environment? And so I wrote down a few things that kind of suggested that um, the Book of Mormon was really talking about Joseph's life. And then I contrasted this with how things had ended up in 1844. Uh, while, we're, while we're here, you can see the sun's coming up, and, the, and that's why I'm getting lighter and lighter. <laughs> I thought maybe you had it's said an something angelic brilliant. Glow. <laughs> the bronze, a big bronze. Or maybe Moroni was right. appearing. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Moroni is starting to appear. <laughs> yeah. And, and so also, um, how... Did you approach this as a contrast to Dan Vogel's making of a prophet? What what was it going to be different about your book? So one, so yeah, so the the thing that I kind of started to identify was that the Book of Mormon was Joseph at twenty three, and that the um, the church in Nauvoo was Joseph at thirty eight, you know, when he died. So th there was definitely a, a big contrast, and sometimes they were complete flips, right? Um, there was a lot of um, rhetoric in the Book of Mormon about helping the poor and everybody being equal and making sure that everybody's taken care of. Um, but by Joseph's death, you know, he was really in charge. Everybody was taking care of him, you know, you know that was he was the top of the pyramid, you know, so it was completely different ideology and I wanted to know how Joseph went from uh, you know the Book of Mormon being this egalitarian understanding of you know sharing through to you know Joseph being you know number one and everybody pay allegiance to him and and really the best explanation was that this was a maturity issue you know he was 23 when the Book of Mormon was written he's 38 but you know he's not only 23 he's a 23 year old nobody you know, yeah, nobody knows who he is. Nobody wants he's a plain old him. Joe. He's a plain old Joe, and he, even worse than that, you know, he's he's poor and dirty, and, and nobody really wants to hang out with him. You know, Josiah Stoll came and got him from New York, so he'd had some prominence, but you know, he liked that. But generally, you know, people disregarded him. Kind of him among he, a certain crowd, it seemed like. Yeah, 
Yeah, and, and a what, con artist and the occult. It wasn't highly regarded. The prominence that he did have. No, and his his his. You know, he got married, and his father-in-law and his his in-laws hated him because they thought he was just a cowpoke. You know, that's right. You know, they eloped. He stole their daughter, in a way. That's right. So he was already on the back foot, and he was trying to prove himself to them. You know, he, but you know, you're 23 years old. You're married. You, your in-laws hate you. You uh, you're trying to make your way in the world. You know, you you do it poor. Um, how are you going to have a voice? And Joseph realized that he was really good at telling stories and he could tell people stories about what was happening in the unseen world under the ground. And he could speak in a voice that wasn't his own and people took him seriously. And that's what the Book of Mormon became. That's what pseudepigrapha is. It's the idea that if you write in somebody else's voice and it's, and it's got some prominence that you can now be, have a voice. And um, before, you know, 1829, Joseph didn't have a voice. And after, 18, after 1830, he had a big voice. And so and that, that and, what changed. And as a storyteller, he could tell the story and a scribe could write it down. He didn't have to sit down and stew over what was going to be the next word. He could just start talking, start telling the story. And there's even evidence of that where he says something and he had kind of has to backtrack a little bit like when he says the weapons of peace or something like that yeah yeah he makes a lot That's of right. corrections and as he's speaking in the moment because you're you're absolutely right um you know joseph is fairly well educated um but he's poor right so paper and ink are expensive they're a luxury um he probably you know he can write we we see that he you know he, he writes but he doesn't write a lot um, but he's got a great speaking voice. He's, you know, many of the characters in the Book of Mormon, um, prophets, right? I'm great at um, speaking, but I'm poor at writing. That's that he's describing himself. Um, people, mm. people were persuaded by his his um, his performance, his his ability to speak. They weren't persuaded by his letters. You know, that that was just his reality, and that's the reality of the characters in the book of mormon too right they you know if, if if you could hear me speak you'd be convinced that this was this was right um my weakness i think writing. that's true today too uh even with general i mean people but especially for people who are con artists or yeah, they their ability in the moment to really kind of whip up a crowd or, or get support i i think and it's just maybe human people. nature yeah Versus what you can read, um, because yeah, you've there's I think there's a lot different going on, and it's easier to kind of parse out in in black and white a little bit more coldly if some of your ideas are a bit crazy. But if you know how to speak in front of an audience, right. you can get them to go quite a ways uh, with some pretty strange ideas. So it makes sense and to if me. You're, yeah, if you're writing stuff, it could be fact check over time. If you're saying stuff right at the in the moment, you just get persuaded, maybe. That, that's a very key understanding I, and um and that that happens to joseph right the book of mormon um it, it's a performance he's speaking it in the moment he's got an idea of what he wants to say and how he's going to talk about the things that are concerning to him or the things that he's hopeful for um but then they're written down and now they're being critiqued um and and that's why the the performance changes over time because his audience is critiquing him um in the moment uh, and this especially happens when um, Oliver and Emma and uh, and Joseph move to the uh, Whitmer Farm in, in Fayette, New York, because there's a bigger audience and they are, you know, hot off the press. They're reading or speak or talking about what has just been written down. And so he's getting a lot more critique. And that's why the, the replacement text, the beginning part of the Book of Mormon, is a lot more dynamic. It's, you know, responding quite a lot to what is being said in the moment because Joseph is having to respond to what the environment and the audience that is kind of you know questioning about him about what is being written in the Book of Mormon. So you decide to start to write a book did you think about like the chapter headings that you were going to do first did you plan it out like as the big picture and then just try to fill in 
the gaps as you were going along, or did you just start from the beginning and just try to chronology work straight through? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, once I identified that pattern that, you know, the Book of Mormon was Joseph at 23 and um, and Nauvoo was Joseph at, you know, in his late 30s, I, I started to to see, you know, contrasts, you know, what were things that were different about the Book of Mormon to the Nauvoo period. And um, and, the, and the easiest ones to see at the beginning were things that were prejudices, things that he was concerned about in the Book of Mormon that he completely flipped on um, by Nauvoo. Things like polygamy, things like um, Catholicism, things like... Uh, Taking care you know, of the poor. Sorry? Taking care of the poor. Taking care of the poor, yeah. Lawyers. he was poor. He was poor. You know, lawyers are a big deal. Um, before the Book of Mormon was written, Joseph was involved in two... Um, you know, lawsuits himself and his and his dad had been involved in a lawsuit before. So three times they'd been to court as a family, you know, um, before the Book of Mormon was written. He, he had a terrible um, view of lawyers and the courtroom and things like that. And this made its way into the Book of Mormon, right? And it made its way into the early Doctrine and Covenants. Um, but, you know, by Missouri, when Joseph in Missouri and he's having these problems with the law, he... Um, he has to use lawyers and he has to, you know, work with lawyers. So Nauvoo, he he writes a city, he writes a city charter. He is now the judge. He is the top lawyer. So, right. you know. And, and he has the means to afford um, some of the best lawyers as well. Exactly. Yeah, it's 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 complete difference because, yeah, he's not poor anymore. He's got prominence. People are trying to help him out. They want to um He's got influence. They want to get that. So this is the complete difference. The Book of Mormon is anti-lawyer. Um, Nauvoo is, you know, really prescriptive court system with Joseph as the as the judge. It's and it, the church today is extremely. It is basically run by lawyers. By lawyers, exactly. Yeah, yeah we're a lawyer lawyer church, and um, because the church yep. is mostly Nauvoo, it's not most. You know, it's. The Book of Mormon is like a bait and switch for the church, right? If you're poor and um, unpowerful, the Book of Mormon resonates with you because that's exactly how Joseph felt when it was created. Um, but of course, the church is powerful. And, you know, and, yeah, there's some lovely, interesting dynamics about that and interesting psychology about that, which I think that Dan Vogel has, um, you know, touched on quite a bit. Um do you yeah, bring that into your book or do you do you stay focused just on that time period and and mainly on Joseph Smith or or do you make any kind of connections with the modern day church in your book? So um generally not I'm really it's um it's really a biography so it's taking Joseph's life so basically his birth to his death but of course there's some things that happened before he was born that influence where he's at and there's some things that happen after that that are interesting I try and touch on those as kind of points but really the, the 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 scope is you know joseph's life and his changes throughout his life um there are some really in, and there are just so many interesting facets about that and, and that's what happened was the first when i started to write li, almost like little mini essays what was his experience with the law what was his experience with um polygamy what was his experience with you know other religions what was his experience with um uh, you know churches in the in the, in the area and so these were really interesting concerns that are in the book of mormon that that changed quite completely by nauvoo and so they're really good contrast um so once i once i identified those patterns i could almost um reverse engineer the and find more patterns so i could find things in nauvoo that he was that that were big for him in Nauvoo and then find kind of where they tracked along his life through the Book of Mormon. And of course, the Book of Mormon speaks to the environment that he's in, you know, in, in 1829, you know, he's a, he, he's a settler really on the frontier. And so there's a lot of Native American rec rhetoric in the Book of Mormon. Uh, but by Nauvoo, of course, the Indian Removal Act has happened. Um, Indians aren't generally a part of everybody's daily life um, by Nauvoo. And so really his focus shifts from, you know, explaining Native Americans and trying to convert them in the Book of Mormon through to um, 
explaining the the evils of the surrounding Gentiles in um, in Missouri and the rest of Illinois, and and also converting you know tons of Europeans who flood into into Nauvoo. So you know there's there's lots of contrasts. Uh, you know sometimes it's he's keeping the same ideas, but he's just applying them to different people. Sometimes he's just maturing in his ability, and this is. Come, this is completely changing the ways he's practicing. So, I, yeah, looking at him and dissecting his life <laughs> by topic. So I'm doing it by topic. You know, I'm not saying, gosh, this is him at eleven, and here are all the things about him. But I'm saying, well, this is this is a topic that becomes really um, salient through his life. How does it change as he evolves in the different circumstances and different places he's in? So was one of your topics like the military or war? Because now that I think about it, I, as a younger um, teenager, kind of liked the war scenes, you know, in the Book of Mormon and, you know, digging round about, you know, building up city walls, doing a defense, you know, sending out spies, subterfuge. And then here, by the time Joseph gets to Nauvoo, he gets to be the general. And you think, oh, what does he know about war? Well, maybe he's been studying war since he was 14, right? Maybe he was qualified to be general of the Nauvoo Legion. Well, he certainly thought he was. <laughs> uh, so so right. is your book finished, Gannett? Is it is it like out for for purchase yet? Or is where are you at? So um so the one cool thing about going on Mormon stories was that I, I was able to talk about the book and where it was at, and I had hoped to publish it. A year ago, um, uh, but uh, uh, fortunately for me, I guess, is that lots of people watch that, and um, some scholars uh, watch that, and they reached out and they have um, helped me with things, and so I've been able to send various parts of my book to other people um, in their area of expertise, and and get them to, to critique what I've done and fact check it, and so it's oh, sure. so, nice. so it's got better. Um, I helped. I helped point out a spelling error on page eight. I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Look, those are, those are all expertise, right? The, the, um, you know, somebody. Well, one of the people that uh, that I identified, you know, was it was really uh, part of doing the TikTok and then taking those TikToks and putting them on YouTube was a chance to test my material, right? I could talk about these particular ideas, you know, just because. By topics, right? There's there's at least sixty topics in my book, so um, so I could do a three minute TikTok on each one of those things, and then people could critique me. You know, in the comments, they could say, "Oh, that was a load of rubbish," or "Have you considered this?" And so, um, I've tried to, gosh, really be peer reviewed all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it, do these ideas hold weight? Can I defend them? Can I show them? Are there better evidences for them? Are there, am I, am I getting this completely wrong? You know, those kinds of things I've been testing throughout. And so the opportunity for people to do that has been great. And I've, I've met some amazing people who have, have really, you know, held my feet to the fire and said, are, are you sure that this is right? And, you know, can you qualify this? And um, one of those people I met via TikTok just because she was making a lot of comments. I could see that she knew her stuff. And um, and so we got talking and she uh, she actually does editing. So I said, oh, look, can you, can you edit my book? Because I can see that you can actually, you know, make it more polished. But you could really, you know, see whether my arguments were making any sense or whether they were off, offline. So she... Um, so I've been sending my stuff to her. She has been going through it with a fine tooth comb. She identified a ton of things that I was lax at or terrible at. I mean, scholars are fabulous for going, you know, this idea is not great or this idea is not, uh, this idea needs work or here you should be looking at this. So that's been absolutely essential. And um, and my editor has, has really gone through and gone, actually, you make, you know, this argument's not, very good or you should put this here or this should be ordered in this way or look that that's not logical go back to the drawing board you know and so she's really gone through with a fine tooth comb and gone mm, yeah this is this is not so a lot it's a lot more not, than just saying you should use a transitory verb here 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so that has been great. Okay, and, so it's still and, a and now, process. Now I'm starting to understand. But better than ever. It, it takes a village to write Ganesh's book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that statement. I think I'll use that. And you're grateful uh, for it, yeah. right? Oh, absolutely grateful. I'm, I The stuff that um, Lacey did for me uh, was um, overwhelming, uh, to say the least. Like, you know, she really hammered me on some things. And it's and, it, and look, I, I just retreated for a couple of months and went, that's just too hard. I can't do it. Um, but I picked it up in the last uh, three weeks and been going through it and doing what she told me to do. And, you know, and, and so it is getting better. And, and so my, well, I've said this so many times, so I don't want to say it too many more times, but I, I hope that it's it will be um, available in a couple of months. That's right. And this episode is on writing about early Mormon history. And uh, when you're finished writing the book, we'll have you on when it when it comes out. And we'll we'll talk about how, you know, things are going with like the reception and uh, other things that you're experiencing around around that. So thanks so much, Ganesh. Um, Maven, do you have anything else that you want to add? No, um, I guess for just you're saying a couple more months. So right now we're recording this beginning of May. So I, I don't know, is there, do you have kind of a goal date, like August is that what we're kind of looking for just to um, kind of keep it fresh? Because we got a betting, we got a betting uh, pool going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking at Sunstone. What One of the things about yeah, I don't have a book published, like, so I've got nothing, but um, because I'm, I'm, been sharing this a lot and looking at things in depth i've uh, you know people have come to me for advice on various aspects particularly the book of mormon um and going through the come follow me has been really good to you know really just en enjoy you know looking at the book of mormon from a joseph um ideology point of view um and so I, i'm presenting at sunstone in in august so i'm coming to the states and i hope to have the book finished and published so that i can do a bit of a launch when i'm there in in the, in the states again so it's a year later than i expected but i um i think that that's, that year has been very valuable yeah so, i agree peer review is always really great so okay so we we'll, we're we're hoping for that then we'll be putting that out uh <laughs> in yeah. the universe for a, a launch in august for when you visit yeah, and so yeah. So it's one thing that's nice about talking to Ganesh is we can tell already that tomorrow is going to be a good day. <laughs> nice and sunshiny <laughs> and uh, something to look forward to. Yes. But I always feel if I talk to Ganesh, I know there's going to be at least one more day. <laughs> that's a benefit from um, speaking to you from the future. One of the other things that I should mention that I think is really important, that the, the only reason I'm able to do any of this is because you know the internet and particularly the Joseph Smith Papers Project has made this all available. Right, you know, the, there's no way I could have written something like this um, in New Zealand, across the other side of the world, in different time zones, without um, mm. you know these resources and the collaboration that social media allows. The um, you know, it's it's a, it's a, a new age. Maybe in ten years' time, AI will be writing everything for us, and we we won't be creative anymore. I don't know, but right now, it's kind of a a real golden age for for um, developing things because anybody, and I'm a good example of it, with a with a with a laptop and um, an internet connection, can um, can discover new things um, by. Uh, going through the Joseph Smith Papers project by um, collaborating it's just online. Smith Papers dot org, I think it's yep. a dot org. We'll have the, we'll have the link for that too. Yeah. So so shout out to them for making this available. That's right. Thanks. Thanks, yeah, Finish. And, and and that's kind of brave in the sense, in the sense because it's yeah you know, it is there is stuff there that that really does challenge you know the 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 norm, um, but. But again, as we, if we go back to really the beginning of the session was, you know, uh, be curious, you know, um, if you can be okay with being wrong, with being able to um, change your worldview or to look at things differently, you know, there's a lot to discover and there's a lot to add to the environment um, 
uh, and I'm the I'm the first to say that I, uh, you know, I've got so much wrong, and I, and even with this book, you know, there'll be things wrong in it. You know, the idea, you know, that actually we don't have to have it all perfect before it's before we can enjoy the moment of it. Um, part of uh, part of what I love is is when people point out that there's something better than what I've currently got because it adds to my learning it adds to my understanding and it um and it it, it, it gives me something greater uh and yeah so that's the the beautiful part about collaboration and about writing and that's why I write I write to be critiqued I write to see that's the boundary. ideas have have some you know legs do they have legs if they don't well let's let's change it and and that's that's creative that's beautiful it's collaborative um hopefully it's also compassionate because we're all humans just trying to muddle through this all together and um and and we want to you know have good stuff that we're involved in but also stuff that is um, building towards a, um, a better and brighter future and there's uh you know if we know better we can do better and that's a good um standard a good thing that you exemplify and we're so grateful to have you on our show today and look, tell our subscribers, you know, thanks for watching. And if you're new to the show, hopefully you can like it and subscribe. And uh, if everybody wants to share this, we're that's one way to get the word out even more. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Bye bye. All right. Thanks, Ganesh.